Then we'll go ahead and begin with mediation. Does anybody need the resolution repeated? We kind of gate our sole contention is a food production currency. Iowa State University quantifies that in the next 30 years, food demand in the United States has increased by 39%, and the American population is on track to expand by nearly 128 million people. Maintaining efficient food production is more important than ever before. Fortunately, the USDA reports that agriculture total factor productivity rates are currently rising by 1.53% each year. However, increasing organic agriculture will reverse food production progress for three key reasons. First is by preventing the use of genetically modified crops. The RS Institute explains that genetic modification or GM codes for qualities such as resistance against pests, climate change, and nutritional deficiencies in plants. Healthline elaborates the adoption of GM technology has reduced pesticide use by 37% while increasing crop production by 22%. However, the USDA notes that because organic agriculture strictly prohibits the use of GM crops, organic crops are incredibly vulnerable to environmental changes. Thus, NAP 2018 quantifies that the average year yield variability rate for organic crops is 15% higher than conventional methods. Second is by restricting research and development. The Economic Research Service reports that since 2008, the United States government has slashed public funding for agriculture research and development by over 20%. Subsequently, MBER explains that America's food industry has relied on large industrial farms to fill the investment gap and foster productive innovation. In fact, the New York Times quantifies that investment from agricultural corporations has increased by 200% since 2003. As a result, the Wall Street Journal concludes that since 1980, innovations funded by industrial agriculture firms have single-handedly reduced irrigation water use by 46%, energy use by 41%, and land use by 16%. However, foreign policy quantifies that small-scale inefficient organic farms lack the capital resources and profit margins necessary to invest in innovation. Nordhaus 2021 quantifies that even though organic agriculture accounts for 5% of all food sales, the organic industry is worth just 0.008% of the total agriculture sector. Third is by degrading topsoil. NTF reports that agriculture in the United States is moving away from intensive tillage practices to preserve topsoil. In fact, U.S. Census of Agriculture found that heavy use of tilling on conventional farms has decreased by 35%, and no-till farming now accounts for 50% of all U.S. crop production. Conversely, the Columbia Climate School reports that because organic agriculture prohibits synthetic fertilizers and pesticides, organic agriculture heavily relies on extreme tilling to remove weeds from the soil. As a result, Zimmerman 2020 found that organic farms have significantly lower topsoil levels needed to facilitate crop growth. As a result of these three key reasons, TUN quantified that organic agriculture production yields are 16% lower across all fields compared to conventional farming. The impact of reducing food production is threefold. First is a climate catastrophe. The Breakthrough Institute explains that because organic crop yields are less than conventional methods, organic farms must utilize more land to sustain production. In fact, Kirchman 2019 quantifies that a 1% decrease in crop yields results in a 1.4% increase in demand for arable crop land. Thus, PBS quantifies organic farms emit 21% more carbon than conventional methods since converting land for agriculture use releases immense amounts of carbon. Forbes concludes that in less carbon emissions decline, 83 million individuals will die from climate change by 2100. Second is food insecurity. FAO reports that organic farms must sell products at higher prices to account for lower yields. As a result, McNair 2021 quantifies that on average organic product products cost 42% more than conventional counterparts, unaffordable to 38 million Americans who are currently food insecure. And third, but finally, is energy crisis. The Scientific American explains that 40% of all U.S. corn is used in added to crude oil and gas. Thus, corn prices are directly correlated to crude oil prices. AGMRC found that if organic corn was used as a fuel additive, crude oil prices could rise up to 160%. Murphy 2015 states that an oil price revolution of this magnitude would shrink the U.S. GDP by nearly 3%. Thus, Luke and I think. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no. Any running prep time stop for five seconds to start now. That's pretty good. 
Everyone here ready? Good. Okay. Everybody ready? Last time, Jason and I have firm resolved in the United States, the benefits of increasing organic agriculture outweigh the harms. Contention one is the developing world. So point A is run off. Nairo 18 reports that global production of GMO crops grew by 574 tons in the last 20 years. Problematically, DeWin 18 finds that 46% of GMO farms cause runoff to go into waterways. This is detrimental to marine ecosystems, as the Rodal Institute 20 explains that herbicides cause runoff to deliver high concentrations of toxins to waterways, killing marine life. Unfortunately, Johnson 15 quantifies that harmful agricultural runoff is expected to double by 2050. However, Zimmerman 20 finds that increasing organic agriculture solves because organic agriculture doesn't utilize synthetic chemicals. Thus, TOC 20 quantifies that there are 64% less reactive chemicals in organic runoff. This is why the EPA 05 concludes that organic agriculture can decrease harmful runoff in oceans by 90%. The impact of starvation. Shabita 21 finds that the United States exports $40 million in fish to Africa, with the reliance increasing each and every year. However, conventional practices undermine exports, as USC 20 reports that runoff from GMO farms have already cost the United States fisheries $2.4 billion. Unfortunately, Corsin 19 explains that countries in Africa rely on fish for two thirds of their protein consumption, making it imperative to save fish exports through organic agriculture. As SOS 12 quantifies, there are 226.7 million people starving in Africa as their primary protein source continues to dwindle. Subpoint B is super pests. Organic agriculture is at, organic agriculture is at an all-time high in Africa. Getting 16 explains that only three out of 54 African nations have allowed the use of GMO crops. Conversely, Daniel 18 reports that the United States has continued to increase GMO use, which has resulted in the continually fostering development of super pests. This is why Charles 20 writes that the current genetically modified crops are losing their protection against many pests. Law 21 illustrates that invasive pests in the Americas have already started to move and decimate crop production in Africa, causing more than $65 billion in damage. However, increasing organic agriculture in the United States helps decrease super pests, as Barack 21 writes that pest infestations for organic farms were significantly lower than that of conventional, meaning GMOs are not needed to ward off pests. Absent organic farms, the impact is crop degradation. Anna 19 quantifies that super pests destroy 125 million tons of crops each and every year. Sadly, London 11 finds that these crops would have fed over 600 million people. Contention two is soil depletion. IATP 21 reports that in the last 50 years, there's been an 800% increase in synthetic fertilizers, reaching over 190 million tons. This hurts our soil in two key ways. The first is by killing microbes. Scherer of the University of California writes that chemical fertilizers kill microbes in the ground, leading to a total breakdown of the soil food web and structure. Sabri 15 explains that fertilizer leads to an excess potassium in the soil, which causes a breakdown of the microbial population in the soil, causing decreased respira respiration and broken nutrition cycles. Even if the microbes survive, chemical fertilizers continue guaranteed harm, as Yale 17 states that synthetic nitrogen fertilizers have led to microbes in the ground using more carbon to process it, decreasing helpful carbon compounds in the ground and increasing harmful carbon compounds in the air. The second is leakage. Yale 18 explains that 120 million tons of synthetic nitrogen are added to farms each and every year. Marler 06 furthers that 82% of inorganic nutrition added to our soils escapes to the air and water, which is why Cantor 20 cites that fertilizers facilitate increased levels of smog and acid rain. EPA 21 writes that this further hurts our crops and acid rain as it strips soil of nutrients and smog strips protective layers off of plants. The impact is soil depletion. TAN 18 reports that synthetic fertilizers have caused the acidification and depletion of soil. The Guardian 19 quantifies that as a result of soil eroding 10 times faster than it can be replenished. This is problematic as Kusir 19 reports that 95% of our crops are grown in topsoil, which Arsenot 14 reports will be de depleted beyond use within the next 60 years. Thus, Jason and I have heard. Yep. If we see
give it one second. We're going to pull up the uh, the actual number. Just pull them up so we Yeah, 21 seconds. Thank you. Oh, we're going to continue on that cycle of traffic. Okay, we're good. 30 seconds. So when you talk about runoffs, you're essentially talking about erosion, right? Uh, no. Just runoff. Okay, but runoff is erosion. That's when water takes nutrients away from the soil. You no, know, erosion is like when you, like the actual like sediment or like the, the, the land actually gets like taken. Runoff is like the chemicals. Of the okay. Yeah. All right. So if I'm an organic farmer, and we both agree, like to be an organic farmer, you have to get like registration, all that, right? Okay. So if I am like an organic farmer and I go to do like tillaging practices, what happens? An organic farmer goes to use tillage practices. Yes. Yeah. They use tillage. No. Large Jason, I will argue that like if you register or like as an organic farmer, the USDA monitors how much tillage you use. If you do too much, it's not. Yeah, but you're still using tillage, right? Sure, sure, but they're monitoring. Okay. Like conventional. They don't That's the difference all. between your and I's world. With you conventional, you you're not using Wait. conventional. Statistically, no. you've seen it decrease fifty percent. In the Fifty percent. It still happens. Work. Like in your world, it yeah, happens. Yeah, but the practice world, as a whole is really decreasing. Out. In your world, you have to use tilling because you have sure, to serve the sure, like, sure. In our world, you don't right, have to use tilling. Even, that even if we have to use GMOs it, hey, it's, listen, even if we yeah. use it, it you, it's used at such a low level that it can't actually hurt the soil. Like you have to prove yeah. that the like tillage is actually occurring yeah, on organic farms. We do farms, prove it. Like, that's our entire story warrant. And what we can contend in any tillage use. Leads to erosion. No, but the it's difference right, between no, our, evidence is, our evidence is our evidence is really yeah, clear. It's evidence. regulated to the point at which you can't like destroy the soil. But yeah. we've been on this for a while. Do you have a okay. question? Yeah. So you talk about in your sub B. Yeah. How does organic farming protect from pests compared to like conventional? Well, sure. So what we've seen in like organic farms is there's like there's two times more super pests in conventional farms than um, organic. So on that like you're having less super pests. Okay. So then like what's like for example like in the conventional world. GMOs protect against like one, they decrease the use of pesticides, no, but two, no, we don't. GMOs have to don't use protect. Pesticides. You see, right now in the status quo, okay. that these super pests are literally finding ways around these GMOs yeah. to the point at which they're not effective. Okay, at the point where GMOs reduce pesticides, forty-seven percent, we're not even seeing them used in the first place. Like GMOs, so we're not even using pesticides, therefore we're not seeing these like super pests being we, built. You're no, simply they are. just we're talking about like the, antibiotic resistance, no, which isn't being implemented okay. or even no, used no, in conventional. No, no, we're literally seeing right now as we speak. These super pests find ways to like evolve around the GMOs and then take down crops yeah. in other countries. Like it's happening yeah. right now. But like pests exist in both worlds. Sure, right? sure. But in our world, there's 50% less. Okay, but how do you protect from the pests in the first place? Uh, we see that organic agriculture is more resistant to pests. Okay. All right, cool. Can I ask a question? Yeah, of course. All right. On this idea of climate change, it's like, is climate, is it American warming or is it global warming? It's our impact for overall, like you see, like in the United States, this re resolution is addressed. Sure, sure. Like Jason, I would argue it doesn't matter. The United States could be the most progressive country when it comes to like climate policy, but if other countries don't follow, it doesn't matter. Climate change yeah. affects the entire but world. But all that matters is that climate change gets worse in your world. We quantify that I mean, organic like Jason, farming increases carbon emissions 21 Jason, I would disagree. That's fine.
I had 35 pixels. 105 total. Can you hear me okay? All right, just as a brief off time roadmap, I am going to start with an observation and uh, I'll go down my map in this case. Let's lay some framework for today's round. The most important thing you're voting on is food production in the United States. Our population is set to increase by 138 million people. We need to feed them, period. That is a prerequisite to everything else because if you can't eat, you're not going to live. That being said, Let's go to their first contention about the developing world. On their sub point A about pesticide runoff, there's four key problems. First, you can pick out their entire argument because it's not unique and their own evidence proves it. We called for their card that talks about solvency and it just says that water management techniques can reduce pesticide runoff by 90%. At that point, we tell you that these techniques are applicable in both worlds, unless they give you a warrant that specifically connects it to organic agriculture, that entire point falls through. But second, you can turn this argument against them because we would tell you conventional investment in the current agricultural sector is the only way to decrease runoff in the long term. Cross by what I tell you from the New York Times, because organic farms are less efficient, they make less money. They have less capital to invest. That's really key because the public sector is cutting off funding for the USDA right now. But we tell you conventional agriculture has invested in satellites with NASA to monitor soil erosion. That's why in the corn belt erosion has decreased by 40% in the last couple decades. But then third, you can turn this argument against them again, because in the end, it boils down to the land. Kurtzman 2019 explains that land is a prerequisite to run off because when you don't have land and there's erosion, that allows more things to run off. But we tell you a 1% decrease in crop yields leads to a 1.4% increase in demand for arable land because if you're making less food, you need more land. Thus, because we solve for land, we went on to that point. But fourth, let's look at their point about Africa. First, you can take out this argument. Logically, not every African is eating fish 24 seven. That's a bit of a stretch. But then we would tell you that in the status quo from the US Department of Agriculture, certain African countries like Ghana, the United States accounts for just 4% of their food supply, unless they give you a quantification or probability that distinguishes specifically the United States' impact in Africa, then we can't weigh it in today's round. But then let's go to their point about super pests. Three key problems here. First, you can take out this entire argument because it's not unique. Cornell explains that the process they're talking about is natural selection. When we do things like pesticides to reduce disease, then other things will develop resistance to it. That's why we need GMOs to combat that resistance. It's just a cycle. That's how the natural world works. It's not unique. But second, you can turn this argument against them because we tell you the best way to prevent super pests is with genetically modified organisms. You can cross five of Bergen in our case from RAS Institute. Because we use genetically modified organisms, we don't have to use pesticides. That's why pesticide use has declined by 37%. And if we're not using pesticides in the first place, we don't have to worry about super pests. We would tell you that organics still use pesticides. But then third, you can take out their impact because again, if they don't give you a link from United States super pests into Africa, this is really, really unclear. Make them give you more. But on their second contention about soil, first an overarching response, you can turn this entire argument against them because the best way to protect soil is to reduce tillage. The U.S. consensus would tell you that in the status quo, American agriculture is moving towards no-till practices. In fact, in the last year alone, intensive tilling practices have declined by 35%. And some states like South Dakota have 50% of their entire industrial agricultural sector with no-tilling practices. However, because you don't have pesticides in organic farming, you always have to till, period, to break up weeds. At the end of the day, that's the most important thing for protecting soil. But then on their point about microbes, you can turn this argument against them with their own evidence because it talks about nitrogen, not synthetic nitrogen. It says when you have a lot of nitrogen in the soil, that's what kills microbes. We would tell you there's more nitrogen with organic because you have to use nitrogen and you can't do synthetic things. Inherently, their argument has nothing to do with organic agriculture. But then, on their point about leakage, you can turn this argument against them because, once again, land is a prerequisite. Why 2021 would tell you you need land and biodiversity to suck up excess carbon and suck up other nutrients that end up in soil and end up leaking into the atmosphere. Subsequently, we tell you because organic needs 200% more land because it's unsustainable, we win as a prerequisite. And for all of these reasons, we negate. Oh, uh, Our link is that it stops pesticides or stops with us. Do you want to see that? Yeah, this is yes. yeah. Yeah.
Give me one second. Where he uses the first or passes, but this is what we talk about using one of these sites for the Jesus. Starting from time without moving. All right, uh, that's time. All right, is everyone ready? Can everyone hear? Okay, I'm going to start on this one. All right. Let's butt off on the overview. He tells us that food production is the most important thing. I would say we have to look to the long term because as the population increases, we need to be able to adapt. But starting off at the top of his rebuttal, he says that as of right now, we see that we can monitor and we see the 40% decrease in the amount of soil erosion right now and run off. We would tell you that at the point where the crop melt, which is what he talks about, is one third depleted. And furthermore, all topsoil will be depleted by 2060. You'll obviously not solve it. But furthermore, we would tell you that right now, the only way to keep soil healthy is organic, as it doesn't overuse the soil, which allows for nutrients to grow. But then furthermore, he says it's not unique because of natural selection. That's the point. We tell you in our case, GMOs accelerate the natural uh, selection process, which causes these pests to expand in their abilities, which allows them to decimate non-GMO crops in Africa. They completely missed the point here. But then furthermore, we would tell you that their evidence that they give us says that you need one more pesticides over time because these uh, pests adapt, which is really problematic. Furthermore, their evidence is from a 1972 event before our 2020 evidence. But then he talks about reduced tillage in conventional farms. This is also happening in organic farms. So we see an increase in crimping, which is an alternative thing. It's also an innovation, which is what they talk about that organic doesn't do. But then furthermore, they talk about how it's nitrogen that's getting in. That's the point. They use synthetic nitrogen fertilizer in the soil, which overloads microorganisms, which causes a limit release. That's why we find that soil in organic farms takes in 3.5 thousand pounds of carbon out of the atmosphere every single year per acre. But then furthermore, they talk about a 200% increase in land. We would tell you after five years, this doesn't exist. And their evidence is from a study in Europe. But going on to their case, at the top, they talk about production. Right now, they say there's a huge increase in demand. And this is really good. And they start off with GMOs. They say GMOs reduce pesticides. This is really problematic because as they tell you in their own evidence, super pests form and you need more and more pesticides to combat, combat them. At that point, you see that all plants are affected by them, including plants in Africa, which are desperately needed. But then secondly, they talk about nutrition, how people are desperately in need of nutrition and GMO supplies this. But GJ20 tells you that there's a lower nutritional value in conventional crops when you compare it to organic. At that point, the best way for nutrition is organic. But then thirdly, they talk about pesticide use going down. But as I said before, it goes up more and more in their evidence. And Wise19 tells you that organic uses 97% less pesticides. If you want to use less pesticides, you have to vote for pro. But moving on to their second point, they talk about R&D right now. They basically say that small farms can't afford First off, if you have 98% of the market that conventional has, the big numbers on R&D are always going to favor you. But we tell you that organic, if it increases, will increase R&D. First off, they're doing research and development right now, as the INN20 tells you that organic is continuing innovation at a high pace. I told you about crimping as an uh, alternative to tillage that's happening right now. But then furthermore, look to the fact that we've seen uh, at 246 projects in a scale over 30 years, we found that organic actually makes more money per acre, meaning that they will have the funds for R&D in the future. But moving on to soil degradation, first off, cross-apply our second contention retail you 
that they're destroying soil, topsoil specifically, and it'll be gone by 2060. But then furthermore, look to the fact that they have to use more pesticides and look to the fact on no-till that only 50% of farms still use it in their best case scenario. Tillage happens on both sides. They have absolutely no solvency. But then furthermore, Haley 19 tells you that A, they have no microorganisms in conventional farms. B, the salts and synthetic fertilizers hurt the pH, which disrupts the soil. And three, there's less biodiversity. But onto their impacts. They talk about climate production or climate change right now. First off, it's just the US. You're not going to solve it. But then secondly, Long 05 tells you they take 3,500 pounds of carbon out of the atmosphere every single year for every single acre of organic farms. On the food insecurity, we tell you that it uses the same yield in their, uh, after five years because of longevity. And then furthermore, Long 05 tells you it does it with 30% less energy. And the NBA tells you that it creates long-term soil health. Meanwhile, theirs is depleted after just a few years. Thank you. All judges ready? Why does organic agriculture make more money per acre? Well, we tell you that the productivity is the same, but the prices are very slightly higher. Exactly. The productivity is the same and the prices are higher. Why? Because it's more expensive to produce and food prices go up as a result. The issue we is tell you uniquely, organic prices are 42% higher than conventional. So the only reason it's making more money is because they're profiting off of people okay. starving. Two things. We'll tell you, one, that we're going to see that prices for organic are actually like approaching conventional right now. Then B, really? that since organic is 72% more efficient, we're going to see that this is going to continue. Right. So do you have any kind of quantification about prices? Because right now they're almost I can, I can one give and a half cross, but I don't know the exact numbers. Okay. All right. Can I have a question? Yeah. All right. Let's talk about your contention on climate change. Yep. Right? So if the U.S. does everything right, is climate change solved? Right. So our argument is not solving universally for climate change. So we're just saying that anything helps for a few reasons. Number one, the United States is the global leader when it comes to green energy. When we do things NATO follows, we need to set a global precedent. Is NATO following? But second, that's a really like problematic logical fallacy because if every single person just says, oh, if we all can't do it, then no one's going to do it. I mean, at the end of the day, we would tell you 21% more emissions that is based off land use, which is false. Like, okay, first off, your 21% comes from an increase in land. Right. We tell you after five years, this doesn't exist. And your card is in Europe. Because we've seen increased efficiency and the same problem. We have? I you three How have evidence. we seen it if it's not going to happen for five years? I mean, this is really, really, this is basically hearsay. Okay, first off, we tell you that after five years, we see the same amount of people. But then furthermore, your evidence is from Europe, not from the U.S. And then thirdly, we tell you that there's more efficiency, Sorry, which allows the same amount of yield. Referring to? The 200%. Okay. It's from Europe. Okay, good question. Yeah, so how long has the United States been using GMOs for? Uh, about 40 years. Right. And right now, you would agree that it makes up about 70% of our food supply. Yeah. So why are we all starving from super pests? I mean, we would tell you that first off, it's the GMOs increase super pests over time. So we're only going to see the problem worsen. But then furthermore, we talk about how you're forcing people in Africa to starve because these super pests make it to Africa and decimate 120 million tons of crops, which could feed hundreds so of millions. Of then let's talk about the time frame. How can we weigh this in today's round? How long is that going to take? But moreover, how the heck are these pests even I mean, going to get to Africa being, in the first place? We've already lost food for 600 million people. Oh, that's right. In your world. In, because of GMO super bad. But then furthermore, we would tell you that if this only worsens, that's bad. All right. Can I have a question? Oh. Yeah, you're good. Okay, yeah. So on R&D, right, you talk about these total numbers. Right. Why is conventional farming better than organic R&D? Is it solely because of increased funding? Right. Yeah. So right now, the public sector is cutting funding from the USDA, which means individual agricultural corporations have to invest more of their profit into innovation. But we tell you again, because organic agriculture, number one, has high yield instability, it's not reliable. But second, in the long term, it's more economically intensive because you have to spend more money on things like alternative fertilizers.
We had one more use. Uh, can we just get a real quick check on our total trust? Right, thank you. Um, it's going to be framework bar case there. Thanks. Start off with framework. Remember what Luke tells you is that food production is the most uh, most important thing in today's round. They just respond by saying you should look to the long term. Long term, you need to feed people. One, we're winning on price. Conventional agriculture costs less. We literally tell you in case that organic agriculture costs 42% more because yields are lower. Also, yields are higher with conventional, 16% less yields with organic. Now, on to the United case. Our sole contention is food production. They just say that we must combat super pests. But remember what Luke tells you in rebuttal. One, it's not unique. It's the laws of natural selection. But two, GMOs solve. We're literally decreasing the use of pesticides with conventional. We're sol solving the problem that they're proposing in today's round with their subway fee. Now into our specific warrants. First, we talk about GMOs. They just say that we're going to use, use less pesticides than organic. But remember, one, conventional already is decreasing pesticide use by 38% directly because of GMOs. GMOs are good. But also remember that actually organic agriculture has more variability in their yields. That's bad because yields, lower yields, more variability in yields doesn't uphold food production, the most important idea in today's round. Next is restricting research and development. They say that we're seeing an increase in organic. It leads to an increase in innovation. They say, first, it's happening right now. Remember, it's not comparable Comparable right now in the sense that, one, conventional agriculture costs less because it's because the innovation solves. But second, they say that organic makes more money. But remember, the reason organic makes more money is because the food costs more. If you want to talk about poverty, if you want to talk about food insecurity, you're going to look at the, the the person in the team that upholds price, it costs 42% lower people in poverty can actually afford food and Luke and I's floor. Our third but final one is um, about topsoil. They just say that tilling happens on both sides. But remember, we already stressed this point as far as the first cross where we tell you that no-till farming already makes up 50% of conventional at the point where you have to till in their world we win this point. There's three impacts. First, climate catastrophe. They just say organic's better, but at the point where PBS tells you that organic farms emit 21% more carbon emissions, we win that the, the impact of 83 million lives, magnitude scope. Second is food insecurity. Remember, prices are lower, 42% lower. People can actually afford food, but also so we upheld feeds, yields, yields are 16% lower in their world. Innovation is not going to happen no matter how they say it. Because again, we talked about the link of how the United States doesn't give U.S. subsidies to um, agriculture and the oil crisis cleanest impact access right there. We're going to see a decrease in 3% of the GDP. Now onto their case. Subpoint A on runoffs. Remember, overall land is a prerequisite to runoffs, and we saw because land usage is less in our world. Subpoint B about super pests. Overall, one, it's not unique, but two, remember that GMO solve we're seeing a decrease in the use. Cont contention two is all about soil depletion. Remember, their own evidence talks about nitrogen, not synthetic nitrogen, which is literally the tenets of their argument. Judges, we have nitrogen in everything, but we don't have synthetic nitrogen. Therefore, their own evidence doesn't even connect it to organic agriculture. You can't even flow or weigh their impacts. Overall, their impacts are all globally centric, not US centric. Therefore, Luke and I can't even officially weigh them against ours. You're gonna prove for Luke and I over them every single time. Again, we uphold food production, the most important thing in today's round. Thus, we urge a strong Next. You see, forty-two percent the oil evidence. Was it forty-two percent? Forty-two percent higher plus. Oh yeah. yeah. In the oil evidence? Yeah. Uh, what part? 
the one you said at the bottom, the uh, three percent, I think it was the three percent. Yeah. Okay. This part it's connects. That's there. So one in the paragraph is from the group says it's two different. It's number two. Also, you just see all this is from the graph that they do fluctuate together. It's like the mean power of the people. And then um, we use that in talking about the other things too. Right? Is that number? And then also from the 42%, uh, we took the averages again of all the ones on the table. Uh, most of them are actually right now. So there's one example that's just a little bit too much. Starting prep time. I just forget 20 seconds. Before I begin, it's going to be their observation, their case are just Everybody good? Everyone hear me? Okay. Speak up if you can. All right. On their observation for the round, they tell you that food production is the most important. They cite this evidence time and time again that organic costs 42% more, but prefer our evidence that was literally published one day after theirs. Theirs was the 18th, ours was the 19th, that found that because co that conventional uh, prices are actually rising faster than that of organic. In the long run, you're actually going to see the prices A, even out, or B, even be cheaper for organic. Jason, I would argue that the reason for uh, higher conventional prices is, or lower conventional prices is because it's a lower market, a bigger market. Think about it logically, because the conventional market 
market in America is so big, it can have lower prices. If you increase the size of the organic market, it's only going to decrease the prices because it has more stability. That's why their argument isn't really making any sense. But then on to our side of the flow, a couple key responses on or on their side of the flow, on their GMO's point, a couple of things. First, they ignore our argument that super pests caused this like these uh, increased use of pesticides. Specifically, their own evidence literally tells you that in order to combat super pests, the United States had to increase their use of pesticides. Insofar, you see an increased use of pesticides, you see a decrease in soil in their world, not ours. But then second, they also ignore that you see a 97% reduction in pesticides in our world. At that point, we're solving for the issue while they're actively perpetuating it. But then on this idea of yield rates, a couple key responses that they ignore, which said after a few years, the yield rate of the both of both organic and conventional becomes almost the same. But even more so, we tell you that in a conventional world, because the soil gets depleted so fast from the poor conventional methods, it doesn't matter even if the yield rates lower in so far that in the long term, the farmland actually used literally becomes unusable. You can't have lower yield rates if you can't even farm off of it. But then on this idea of R&D, a couple of problems. Remember, once again, the conventional market is really, really big right now. That's why it has so much research and development. But when you actually increase your other industries, such as organic, you're obviously going to see more increase in research and development. But even more so, Jay's reason rebuttal that they clean ignore that you're actually seeing more research and development right now in the status quo. We're seeing alternatives to tillage, which is, actually, which is a good thing because you're seeing more profit for these farms, which can only lead to an increase in research and development. But then on this third point about topsoil, they ignore the one or response at the top that says when you have more pesticides, you hurt the topsoil. Remember, there's more pesticides in their world, which means they're hurting the topsoil at a higher rate. But then second, they ignore the Grover 20 evidence that tells you that when you sign up to be an organic farmer, you actually have to regulate the amount of tillage you use to the point at which it's not harmful to the soil. Tillage isn't fundamentally bad when it's regulated to the point at which it's not harmful. If tillage isn't hurting in our world, but it's back, it's happening in theirs and it's unregulated to the point where it's hurting the soil. But then on the impacts of food insecurity, Jason, I would argue that they're destroying soil at a faster rate with most of, most of it will be gone by 2060. You can't have food insecurity in our world if the soil is a lot more replenishable, but in their world, insofar you don't have soil, you don't have food, you have food insecurity. But then on this idea of oil prices, their evidence literally doesn't find any direct correlation. It just says, oh, they happen at the same time, but they don't actually interact with each other. But then onto our side of the globe, the cleanest place to go to us on our argument about super pests. They say, oh, it's natural selection. Our, that's our argument is that these GMOs make it so that these super that these pests become super pests. They evolve past the GMO and they'll develop to the point at which they go and spread and destroy millions upon millions of crops. That's problematic because we see in places like Africa where hundreds of thousands of crops are destroyed. It's a clear pro ballot. We save 600 million lives. I, I guess we just gotta be really loud. Sounds good. Is this a good point? If we need to speak up, can I do you all just want to raise your hand just so we know? All right, uh, you guys got first question whenever you're ready. So you guys keep talking about how when you increase organic, we're going to see like a decrease in overall prices and like an increase in yields, but don't you need R&D to access that? Yeah, R&D is happening right now. We say a uh, summary and rebuttal that we're actually seeing a lot of R&D right now, uh, specifically like things to tell us. Right, so a lot doesn't really matter because a lot doesn't allow us to compare it to conventional. So if you have yeah, any, you can't compare the two because one is like smaller, right? Like you can't compare a really massive industry to one that's only 1% of total That's market. exactly our point because yeah, organic our arguments that you will never be able to consolidate an investment because inherently it makes less money because no, no, one, no, very Our argument is that in a world, world, when you water, increase organic access, you have a bigger market. market. Our arguments that when you increase organic agriculture, you're obviously going to have a bigger market, which increases investment. I, as an investor, probably not going to invest in a market that's only 1%. Right. I'm not disagreeing with that. That's logically sound, except it won't be enough. What you have to do is prove how it like compares to the R&D that we're seeing right now with conventional industrial agriculture. We've really given you several different courts that explicitly explain we why organic ag right will never be able to compare. We tell you that right now, both sides are conducting R&D. One is about 99 times bigger, but the only unique link that you have is that conventional makes more money so that they can invest more. But Max and me both tell you that organic actually makes slightly more than conventional, which you don't respond to in rebuttal or summary. Right. At that it's point, your only unique link is not overall yeah. revenue and not external costs. You can look to the Nordhaus evidence. We literally give you a case which tells you that organic makes up 5% of the total industry, but it's only worth 0.008%. The money just yeah. isn't there to create yeah. the innovation. That's our argument. When you grow an industry, people are going to invest. Yeah, but the ratio of the investment and the actual size of the industry doesn't sure. compare. Sure. Again, even more so, it doesn't matter. Organic agriculture accounts for 0.008 percent of the entire sector. 
listen, it doesn't matter like how much is being invested in so far you're seeing results. We're seeing right now, you told me it's like 0.6%, but we're already seeing alternatives come to the village and other massive like groundbreaking innovations. Yeah. Like even if it's a small number, it's still producing a high amount. But let me ask a question. Yeah. All right. So if like, how does natural selection work? How does natural selection work? Yeah. Organisms with favorable qualities will live longer and they'll pass on their genetic information to their offspring. Yeah, sure. So if the environment is harder to survive and organisms that survive in that environment are typically stronger, right? Right. So I understand where you're going with this, but again, here's another logical fallacy that you guys are really relying on. Obviously, if we make anything better, things are going to respond that are competitive to it. That doesn't mean we should just stop trying because our other alternative is starving. Wait, wait, we no, you're, tell you wait, you have GMOs evidence. and then there's resistance. You're, we can then engineer new GMOs to combat that. In your world, you're, no, you're no, sitting no, back listen, and letting Your evidence start. tells me in 1972, we started commenting this pest. It's been 60 years. They're literally, with right, pesticides, so that's really pesticides. Example, they're destroying hundreds of millions of crops. When you give us more and more pesticides, it increases resistance levels. No, but you GMOs literally doesn't. Pesticides. It's so far your evidence, one, says we increase pesticides, and two, our evidence says that we're actually seeing more crops being destroyed. I'll run, I'll run my 15 seconds. As a brief off time roadmap, I'm going to go over our framework and then do two key relations. In today's round, you're going to be voting on food supply. It's a prerequisite to everything they're saying because if people are dead, nothing else matters. Here's why we went on food supply. First, genetically modified organisms are the most important thing in today's round because they are the most versatile. We tell you from health, GMOs can be used to combat essentially anything that can kill a plant. That's why they have uniquely increased crop yields by 22% and reduced the use of pesticides by 37%. But then on R&D, they never interact with the part of our warranting, which comes from the Economic Research Service. The reason why we need conventional agriculture is because the federal government is cutting off subsidies from the USDA. Organic agriculture logistically can never generate enough capital. That's just a fact. But then, on our point about topsoil, we win this argument because in a pro world, there will always be tilling to a certain extent. However, we tell you that in the status quo, intensive tilling has decreased by 35% in the last year, and the United States is on track to become entirely no-till agriculture. No tilling is the best way. It's better than pesticides because no like tilling actually destroys the soil. We have clean access to our three impacts. First, climate change. When we destroy land, 83 million people could die we outweigh. Second, 38 million individuals could die in a food shortage, but then lastly on our point about the oil crisis, we would see GDP shrink by 3%. It is a direct correlation. You can call for the card if you want to see it. The second key voting issue is super pests. You cannot vote for pro here. First is on time frame. They can see we've had GMOs for 40 years and we haven't seen any effects from super pests. That means it's gonna take at least another 40 years and probably more to actually see their impacts happen. They give you no probability, but moreover, they don't actually connect it to their impact. They never tell you how super pests in the United States specifically would kill 600 million people. That doesn't really make any logical sense. But moreover, this entire argument turns against them because we tell you from RS Institute, you use 37% less pesticides with genetically modified organisms. That's key because with less pesticides, there's less things to be resistant to. For these reasons, you'll be voting neg in the base round. Thank you. We're running for the rest of the round. How much do we have left? We're out. Oh, okay, cool. Can everyone hear me? All right. I'm just going to start on their case. And we're going to go back. Uh, is everybody ready? Let's start off with their overview of food production. We tell you that 600 million people could have been fed by crops that were destroyed by super pests. They don't give you a single number in the entire round of how much food supply they actually provide for the earth. But moving on to their first contention, when they talk about GMOs, they say GMOs are inherently better for two reasons. The first is pesticides. Their own evidence tells you that they have to continually increase pesticides because GMOs make super pests. But then furthermore, on nutritional value, me and Max tell you that there's less nutritional value in GMOs. That goes unresponded through the round. Then on the second contention about R&D, 
They basically get up here and say, oh, our only unique reason is that they don't have enough money. That's because they're a smaller market. But remember what me and Max tell you, is that they make more money on these farms comparably, but they're just a smaller market. You increase the market, you increase the R&D, they're already doing it right now. But then they talk about tillage. We tell you that both organic and conventional farms are both decreasing tillage. This isn't happening in either world. But the unique reasons why they increase soil degradation is because of pesticides. We tell you that pesticides going into the ground have caused the total amount of topsoil to be eroded beyond replacement at 10 times the rate of replacement. At that point, the only way you're going to see long-term soil health is if you vote for the pro side. But then what you're going to vote off today is super pest. Their only response is, oh, it's natural selection and it's not going to happen. But first off, it's already happening right now. And second off, when you accelerate the rate of natural selection, you cause these pests to become too strong for these plants to resist. They say, oh, we use less pesticides. But remember, their own evidence tells you that they have to continually increase the amount of pesticides because the super pests adapt. But then furthermore, me and Max tell you that you reduce pesticide use by 97%. This is why you flow very cleanly that when you have GM those, these pests become super pests, which is really, really problematic because we tell you that these pests have escaped from the United States and gone over to Africa and destroyed 120 million tons of crops. This is why you see that 600 million people could have been fed with this food. So by their own framework, we feed the most people, increase the most food supply, vote pro. Thank you.